Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shakespeare and Company. One way of documenting the slow march of societal change is through official recorded history. That's to say through dates and analysis of protests, of the foundation of activist groups, of the passage of parliamentary bills or of press-driven scandals and their aftermath. But such an approach is fated to only ever offer part of the story. If one wants a deeper understanding of how these changes impact on people's lives, it's necessary to explore the often undocumented shifts in mores, in language, but also in public acceptance and self-image. This can be very tricky territory for the historian. Thank heavens, therefore, for the novelist. With The Sparsholt Affair, Alan Hollinghurst has not only written a hugely entertaining mo and moving novel that crackles with all the wit, insight and linguistic brilliance that won him the Booker Prize, but he also leads readers through an enlightening examination of how gay life in Britain has changed over the last 70 years, from the bombings and blackouts of the Second World War, through, through the tectonic shifts of the 60s and 70s, to the tech-aided social interactions of the present day. Alan Hollinghurst is the author of five previous novels, The Swimming Pool Library, The Folding Star, The Spell, Line of Beauty and The Stranger's Child. He's received the Somerset Maugham Award, the James Tate Black Memorial Prize for Fiction and the 2004 Man Booker Prize. The Guardian said that Alan Hollinghurst's new novel was almost as hard to pin down as it is to put down. The Evening Standard said it makes a lot of contemporary fiction seem thin and underachieving. And reviewing it for The Observer, Alex Preston called Alan Hollinghurst the greatest prose stylist writing in English today, declaring The Sparshalt Affair his most beautiful novel yet. Please join me in welcoming Alan Hollinghurst to Shakespeare and Company. So during this evening, we're going to have two short readings from The Sparshalt Affair, and I think we're going to um, kick off with the first one before Alan and I begin our conversation. Um, this is a book, as Adam has hinted, covering quite a wide time span, and it's in five episodes, um, often with big gaps in between them. And the first episode is set in Oxford um, in the autumn of 1940, a rather strange time when the Blitz was raging in London, 50 miles away. Um, Oxford itself was never bombed, and um, although feeling all, so all sorts of unusual pressures from, from the war and, and, and what was going on around, was, was in a strange, strangely sort of rem removed from the action, and um, university life itself had rather changed, and most undergraduates just came up to Oxford for one year and did a, a sort of short degree, because after that they were called up for military service. Um, this first section of the book is narrated, r recalled long afterwards um, by someone called Freddie Green, who is mysteriously um, exempt from service, and is actually he's a, in his third year, and it's set in Christchurch, one of the biggest and grandest of Oxford's colleges, um, and they've just had a meeting at the beginning of the, the term of a literary society which exists to get famous writers to come and read uh, from their new work um, to the students. I don't know why they want, the, want to do that. Um, and um, so in this scene you will hear of someone called Charlie, who you don't need to worry about, um, Freddie the host um, and narrator, um, Evert Dax, who is um, a, an English a, a undergraduate reading English, whose father is a, a sort of a, a overbearing and famous novelist whom they've um, invited, rather against his better judgment, to um, come and address their club. And the third person is called Peter Coyle, who is a rather camp painter. Um, he's actually at the Slade School of Art in London, but one of the many of things which was evacuated from L London to Oxford during the war was the Slade School, which was re-established in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. And Peter's very much missing the, uh, the excitements of London itself and looking for anything sort of remotely titillating in, um, in the dreariness of wartime Oxford. It's, it's dus dusk is falling on an October evening and uh, Peter is l looking out of the window Freddie, have you seen this man? Who is it? I went across. Oh, the exhibitionist, I suppose you mean, I said. No, he, he's gone, said Peter, still staring out. I stood at his shoulder and stared too. 
It was that brief time between sunset and the blackout when you could see into other people's rooms. Tall panes which had reflected the sky all day now glowed companionably here and there, and figures were revealed at work or moving around behind the lit grid of the sashes. In the set directly opposite, old Sangster, the blind French don, was giving a tutorial to a young man so supine that he might have been asleep. And on the floor above, beneath the dark horizontal of the cornice and the broad pediment, a single window was alight, a lamp on the desk projecting a brilliant arc across the wall and ceiling. I spotted him the other day, I said. He must be one of the new men. Peter waited with pretended patience, and Evert, frowning still, came back and looked out as well. Now a rhythmical shadow had started to leap and shrink across the distant ceiling. Oh yes, him, Evert said, as the source of the shadow moved slowly into view, a figure in a gleaming singlet, steadily lifting and lowering a pair of hand weights. He did so with concentration, though with no apparent effort, but of course it was hard to tell at this distance, from which he showed in his square of light as massive and abstracted, as if shaped from light himself. Peter put his hand on my arm. My dear, he said, I seem to have found my new model, at which Evert made a little gasp and looked at him furiously for a second. Well, you better get a move on, I said, since these days new men left as quickly and unnoticed as they came. Even you must admire that glorious head, like a Roman gladiator, Freddy, said Peter, and those powerful shoulders. Do you see the blue veins standing in the upper arms? Not without my telescope, I said. <laughs> I went to fill the kettle from the tap on the landing and found Jill Darrow coming up the stairs. She was late for the meeting at which she might have liked to vote herself. I was very glad to see her, but the atmosphere, which had taken on a hint of deviancy, rather changed when she came into the room. She hadn't had the benefit of ten years in a boys' boarding school, with all its ingrained depravities. I doubt she'd ever seen a naked man. Charlie said, Ah, Darrow, and half stood up, then dropped back into his chair with an informality that might or might not have been flattering. We want Dax to ask his father, he said, as she removed her coat and took in who was there. I set about making the tea. Oh, I see, said Jill. There was a natural uncertainty in Evert's presence as to what could be said about his father. At the window, Evert seemed not to know she had come in. He and Peter stood staring up at the room opposite. Their backs were expressive, Peter smaller, hair thick and temperamental, in the patched tweed jacket which always gave off dim chemical odours of the studio. Evert, neat and hesitant, a strictly raised boy in an unusually good suit, who seemed to gaze at pleasure as at the far bank of a river. "'What are you two staring at?' Jill said. "'Oh, you mustn't look,' said Peter, turning and grinning at her, at which she went straight to the window, myself close behind. The gladiator was still in view, though now with his back turned, and doing something with a piece of rope. I was almost relieved to see that the scouts had started their rounds. At one window and then the next, a small, black-coated figure appeared, reached up to close the shutters, and removed all sign of life. Across the way, the scout came into Sangster's room, half hidden by the oblong screen he carried through into the bedroom, and after a minute reappeared, edged round the two occupants, and kneeling on the window seat, gazed out for a curious few seconds before pulling the tall shutters to. By dinner time, the great stone buildings would be lightless as ruins. Ah, Phil, said Charlie, behind us my own scout had come in to do the same for us. I said sternly, do you know who this fellow is, Phil? Phil had fought at the Battle of Luce, and after that earlier war had spent fifteen years in the Oxford police. He was affable and devoted to the college, but seemed sometimes to regret that he'd ended up in an apron, dusting and washing dishes for young men he was powerless to discipline. What was it, sir? He propped his screen against the wall and came over eagerly, as if I'd spotted a miscreant. I noticed now that our own reflections were hanging very faintly between us and the view of other windows. I pointed upwards. This ridiculous fellow, I said. Oh, him, sir, said Phil. A bit disappointed, but trying for a moment to share our own interest in the luminous figure. Uh, I happen to know there was a bit of trouble there. What sort of trouble? said Peter. Well, the noise, sir, 
Dr. Sangster's been complaining about it. Oh, said Everett, noise? Rhythmical creaking, apparently, sir, <laughs> said Phil, with a grim look. Oh, goodness, said Everett. <laughs> he's not one of ours, though, in fact, said Phil. Ah, I said. No, he's one of the Brazenose men, said Phil. In the vast, gloomy college, its staircase is half deserted since the start of the war. New members of requisitioned colleges have been slipped in here and there, disoriented freshmen who found themselves also evacuees. Brazenose had been seized by a ministry of some kind, who, according to my tutor, were rather unsure what to do with it. If you could just excuse me, Mr. Green. Oh, of course, Phil. You don't happen to know his name, said Jill. He's called Sparsholt, miss, said Phil, with a small cough as he swung the shutters to and dropped the iron bar safely in its slot. Sparsholt, said Peter, weighing the word and smiling slyly at Everett. Sounds like part of an engine or a gun. Phil looked at him blankly for a second or two. I dare say you're right, sir, he said, and went through into the bedroom. I set out my best mice and cups, which I hoped might please Jill, and in the new closeness of the panelled and shuttered room, we settled down to have tea. Thank you very much. Um, I guess where I'd like to begin the conversation is about the the period of time that the the novel covers. Um, as we as we'll, we'll come on to discuss the, the sort of the shift in focus um, a little bit later, but but the principal protagonist, let's say uh, Johnny Sparshold, his I, I'd say is more or less a contemporary of yourself. That's right. Yes, and uh, it just interests me that when you're when you're starting off on a novel of this kind of historical scope, um, it, it might, someone might think, oh, it would make sense for it to, for example, to, to follow a time period that you were familiar with. Whereas this very clearly starts at a moment uh, before you were born and before, obviously, therefore, before you would remember anything. And I'm just curious about why you decided to begin the novel in wartime Oxford. Um, probably for all sorts of reasons. I mean, it's very much a book about um, children and their often rather difficult fathers mm -hmm. um, and I wanted it to be a, a, to, to trace the pattern of of really three generations mm -hmm. of the Sparshalt family in it um, and although I knew that Johnny the, the son of the man who, whom you've seen exercising in the window that, in that first chapter uh, was going to be the centre of the, the, the book's kind of centre of consciousness as it were um, A lot of the book is really about the effect of his father, and I mean, I d it's a difficult book to talk about this without giving things away. But sure. <laughs> I, 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 I think you know we can't hide the fact that there is, there is a, a scandal that mm. happens in the middle of this book involving involving his father. Um, and I was certainly fascinated in trying to trace w what the impact of mm -hmm. such a scandal might be on a son, especially with this unusual name, who had to, had to live with it, uh, uh, you know, as he was sort of coming to maturity himself. Um, but I was also interested in what might have predisposed the, the, mm. the father to get into this kind of fix. Mm. Um, so it's the first part of the book is, is a, a rather oblique study of a young man whom nobody really knows at all at all well, but on, on whom, because of his appearance and glamour and strength and so on, uh, a lot of people, I mean, certainly the two, the two men looking out of the mm. window, kind of project their, their fantasies. Um, and I suppose we see him, he, he's come up to Oxford for a very brief time. He's one of those people who doesn't regard Oxford as a, a, an opportunity to avoid life. He, mm. sees, he sees it as, a, as um, a step in a very clearly planned um, su succession of events. He's going to join up, he's going to join the RAF, he's going to become a pilot, and after the war he's going to um, establish a, an engineering firm. And he does all those things. Mm. You know, he's, he's someone very, very determined and, and focused. Um, and remains, I think, rather a mystery to, mm. to other, other people. But I think in this first section, you see him sort of exploring his own power mm. and um, beginning to realise that he, he has this gift of making other people do things for him. And I suppose from the outside, um, it, it, it was a very specific time to be at Oxford. Uh, because I suppose we project this... 
uh, timelessness in a way onto the university. Um, the sort of the traditions which are centuries old and which are still maintained. And of, and of course, you know, I'm sure things, things change from one generation to the next, but there does seem to be this sort of enduring pattern to student life there. And yet, at the beginning of the Second World War, of course, as you said, things were things were quite different. Certain colleges were evacuated, undergraduate degrees were shorter. Just the the expectations of the of the young students uh, from how their lives were going to go was uh, was very different. Yeah, no, I'm very interested. I mean, I've known Ox. You know, I, I spent my childhood about 15 miles from Oxford. I can't remember a time when I sort of didn't know Oxford. You know, and I was a student there and lived there for nearly 10 years and still go back to it and I, I'm very sort of aware of its histories and atmospheres and so forth and, and of course you're quite right the thing that it's not normally associated with is, is a, mm -hmm. an image of sort of gild, gilded youth um, mm -hmm. uh, as against sort of uh, scholastic struggle and so forth um, this period is so different um, during the war and that was one that I think very little known actually mm -hmm. uh, and I you know looking around I couldn't find other than Philip Larkin's wonderful mm -hmm. novel Jill um, which I mean, Larkin was an undergraduate a, a little later than this but oh. at St John's College dur during the war uh, and wrote this extraordinarily atmospheric novel about a, a boy from the Midlands mm -hmm. who, uh, who com comes down to o Oxford and he's rubbing up against the, you know, the Oxford of as it might be the Oxford of Evelyn, the characters of Evelyn War the kind mm -hmm. of public school boys and so forth um, and that was very very useful to me and giving uh -huh. me some sense of, of the atmosphere but it, you're right it's very it's, it's something which hasn't been written mm -hmm. about much and I thought the strange transfer to Oxford of, of things from mm -hmm. London you know MI uh, it sort of features in a small way in the book MI5 mm -hmm. for instance who, uh, divided its operations in the autumn of 1940 into town and country mm -hmm. uh, uh, and country was um, established in Blenheim Palace mm -hmm. just, just outside Oxford um, and uh, it was supposed to be very secret, but everybody it had its own bus, which went out every, <laughs> every day, sort of taking all the spies and their typists um, at, at mm. Blenheim Palace. And um, so that that was a, a, another fascinating mm. aspect of uh, of um, of the strangely displaced, mm. unsettled mood, the mood of transience, underlying fear, I mm. suppose. You know, and the, the sense. I mean, I was very fortunate in ha having a, a very dear old friend who actually was an undergraduate at Christchurch dur during the war, who who reminisced to me richly about the whole subject. But but getting that thing which we tend to forget of how how in the early phases of the war people thought we probably would lose it uh -huh. quite soon, you know. So every, everything is under undermined by this sense of transience and insecurity, which of course has quite a strong kind of aphrodisiac effect yeah. as well, which I was interested. In. <laughs> and. I was wondering because you, you described the, the Philip Larkin book as extraordinarily atmospheric yeah. and that was almost exactly the description I was going to fire back at you about this. I mean, the, the whole novel, I think, uh, for the different epochs, but I think specifically um, the, the Oxford uh, section, right down to the smells. I mean, there's a moment you, you talk about the, the odd raw smell of the blackout curtains and the, uh, the, the coke fire. Um, and I was just wondering how you wrote yourself into, into Oxford of the 40s. I mean, through the, the reminiscences of your well, old friend, partly that, Philip Larkin. Yes, partly just making it up, I think, uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> it's a feeling of authenticity. <laughs> yeah. I mean, authenticity is, is a funny thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've always rather disliked the whole business of research. Uh -huh. um, pa partly because <laughs> partly I'm so idle, and, and part, partly because I think it all too easily t sort of grins out of the page in historical fiction. Mm -hmm. and, and often uh, you, you read something which is so overloaded mm -hmm. with... with um, sort of period indicators mm -hmm. and, and, and so forth. But it actually um, lessens the sense of verisimilitude. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I mean, I'm very interested in trying to create w you know, what it was like to be alive in the past without mm -hmm. any sense of its future mm -hmm. quaintness, as it were. Mm -hmm. you know. um, and people living in the muddle of the present and all the things from the past mm -hmm. with which you know, we're constantly surrounded. Um, there's no knowledge of the future. Uh -huh. And... Um, it seemed to me that if you just had, you, know, you don't want to make terrible mm -hmm. howlers, obviously, but if you have sufficient little, mm -hmm. little, little details, they just substantiate a world, mm -hmm. and you don't want to sort of press it too hard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I have seen and probably smelt a coke fire. Uh -huh. so I mean, I <laughs> <laughs> Another thing, which I guess was maybe was quite specific about this 
um, this epoch was. Uh, I mean, you talked about MI5 at uh, Blenheim Palace, and um, I'm just thinking of the things that people... The, it was quite a secretive time. There were things that could be talked about that couldn't be talked yes. about. I mean, there was, of course, this sort of dangerous talk, costs lives, and, and things like that. That's right. And um, it just sort of thinking of that in the context of the, the wider novel, particularly for the lives of gay people in Britain, um, because a, a lot of the time, one of the things that we feel as the novel progresses is the different way uh, gay people can exist in Britain and also how the lives of gay people are talked about. Yes. And I just found it fascinating that in this particular section that this comes in the context of plenty of other things, in fact, which cannot be talked about, you know, whether it be what's keeping Freddie Green from service, whether it's whether it be what, where the bus, you know, why people yeah. are going to Blenheim Palace on the bus. And yet one of the things which I guess maybe struck me and perhaps overturned some of the preconceptions I had about that time was quite how freely um, the, the fact that uh, homosexuality was acknowledged, at least amongst this, uh, this milieu in Oxford. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's um, typical, prob probably, and, and I, I wanted this to be a sort of... Amelia, sort of ex-public mm. schoolboys you know, at a very privileged university who are living in their own sort of bu bubble in, term, in terms of, sort of ethics. Um, and um, I think that's you know, it's certainly true to life, mm -hmm. that, that aspect of it. So the, the, and the character called Charlie, whom you barely, you know, is obviously rather disapproves of all, of all this, this kind of thing. Um, and it, and the, what happens, the, the kind of affair that happens in the, the first section of the book is intensely mm -hmm. secret. And when Freddie is writing about it 30 years later or something, he says, you know, he thinks that no, nobody else until this moment mm -hmm. no, knows about it. I mean, it, 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 it has intensely the nature of the private life mm -hmm. in the past, which if he, if he weren't writing this thing, perhaps no one would ever know about it. Um, and um, the blackout and all the prevailing conditions of Oxford and the war obviously, obviously were very sort of helpful for, for generating that, that kind of um, romantic, erotic secrecy as, as well. I mean, there's that fascinating book by Lara Feigl called The Love Charm of mm. Bombs, which is about the impact of the London Blitz on a number of writers such as Graham Greene and mm -hmm. Henry Greene, no relation. Um, and you know, the idea that you know, actually you might be going to die tomorrow, if not ne next mm. week, you know, so you better have fun now. Mm. Uh, and, and the blackout itself providing a cover for all kinds of activity um, so I wanted something of that that sense of a qu uh, actually a quite free sort of mm -hmm. se sexual thing going on uh, in what you might think of as rather constrained circumstances yeah. and of course this is also the section where we get closest to getting to know David Sparsholt yeah. who whose presence of course is felt uh, throughout the rest of the book um, but this is a moment where well yeah as, as a young man we, we find out most about him um, so let's let's talk a little bit about him so you, you said about this was sort of a exclusive milieu of uh, sort of public school boys um, but he's a little bit different I mean um, uh, when you when you talk about Philip Larkin you smiled about the fact that he's a Midlands boy kind of come south to Oxford and yeah. that's the case yes yeah, so that's very much the case with, with David yes he comes from Nuneaton um, he, he comes from a, a kind of um, upwardly mobile sort of working class background mm -hmm. I suppose an a sort of ambitious hard working background um, and yes he, he comes to Oxford without any of the sort of assumptions about it and the sort of life that he might lead there that the, all these other people you meet mm -hmm. have yeah and as a result, in fact, when he engages with um, with the students around him, in fact, his his language is quite um, is quite different from from theirs. I think that's right. Yes, um, and he's he's an engineer. You know, he, so, uh, and they they of course are all people steeped in the humanities mm -hmm. and everything, and they're, and they're, and. Um, literary reference and comparison to mm. for, for anything that's going on in their lives. Um, he absolutely doesn't have that mm. at all. He makes it quite clear that he has no time for reading. Mm. Uh, and uh, I mean, I have you know, quite a bit of fun in this book with mm. people who don't who don't read. Mm -hmm. And his, his his son his son doesn't read because he's he's dyslexic and sort of sort of can't read. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, he, he he hasn't got any time for mm. really for, for the, the, the 
what these people i mean mm. he thinks they're just sort of frittering away their uh-huh. time and that they're sort of spoiled I think. Yeah. and is enthusiastic as well about certain life choices which uh, the others are kind of keeping at arm's length whether but, that be serving in the war yeah. whether that be getting married yeah. there's he's very specifically says that he he more than anything he wants a son yeah. um and again this sets him sets him apart from uh, the rest of the oxford yeah. sea yes. yeah. um before we move on to talk about the the sort of the the shift which is a shift in voice but also uh, also in a sort of in time period i just like to spend a little bit of time with this figure of dax av dax oh, yes. um, the novelist because i think whenever whenever a novelist writes about another novelist um i think the readers kind of ask questions they ask they sort of wonder you know is the is the novelist maybe trying to tell us something here are they having fun with perhaps an acquaintance or a, are they perhaps undermining some sort of view of literature and yes. um so could you maybe just talk a little bit about av dax and his his role yes i mean i'm very fascinated by the, the kind of vagaries of literary re- reputation mm-hmm. um and in a way my my previous book the stranger's child which is, is about a, a very minor sort of first world, world war poet who, who achieves f- 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 um through being killed very young he, he he's achieves a certain um, fame way, way beyond that which would be merited by his by his works and the book really sort of traces how he, how he is regarded and different kinds of interest in him o- over the following 70 or 80 years um and it's partly that i mean i had it i'm very happily fortunately staying in the apartment upstairs here and i sort of I thought I was going to go go and look at Notre Dame, but actually I just got so absorbed in looking <laughs> looking at the old books you know, and and those you know the books by and about Hemingway and Joyce and, and you know the, the great names which continue to reverberate and those other books from, from writers in the forties and fifties which have just completely disappeared um, and that that whole thing I fi- I find very that sort of second hand bookshop mm-hmm. mood yeah. um, and I wanted to create in Dax someone who is very very celebrated um in his time an extremely serious writer who takes himself extremely seriously uh, i mean sufferably so um and is you know, a certain kinds of serious writer are m- even more highly regarded in france than than he is in <laughs> in england and um has received various sort of french honors and so um and um he's a type i mean there are one or two writers that i sort of had in mind there's, I mean, actually, a very, very sort of gifted writer called Charles Morgan, who was immensely celebrated in the 30s and 40s. Um, and I read his most famous book, The Fountain, a few years ago. And it is, it is an achievement. Mm-hmm. Um, but you just know that, apart from weirdos like me, no one is ever going to read this uh-huh. book again. <laughs> but it was hugely praised at the time. Um, and um, it is, he and his voluminous writings have just disappeared without mm-hmm. trace. Um, uh, and one of the things you can do if you have this sort of long span and generational pattern is to sort of wa- watch this mm. this ri- rise and fall. Um, I mean, as a person in the book, he, he's he's a bit of a, a monster, mm. but he's also a sort of comic comic mm. turn. You know, he he turns up and rather rather terrorises these young undergraduates <laughs> who have invited him to come and speak to them. Um, and his son Everett, who is sort of quite an important character mm. in the later parts of the book, you know, will in- inherit his his big. London mm. house, but uh, can't maintain it in the in the style of his his pompous mm. father, and so we watch f- another sort of decline there, uh. where the, the, the house <laughs> is all sort of sub- subdivided and rooms mm. are let off to eccentric people, mm. and mm. it becomes something completely different from mm. from what it had been in his father's time. There was um, there's a moment where he's spoken of as a writer who's sort of uh, admired rather than enjoyed, and exactly, yeah. in the um, I I think it was the the review, the Alex Preston review in The Observer this weekend. Um, He he kind of had the contention that maybe uh, you were sort of suggesting that maybe you can be both, in fact. I thought you were going to say the other way around. Yeah, Uh, yeah, I mean, I do think enjoyableness is quite quite an important Mm -hmm. aspect of of, of, uh, the experience of reading fiction mm-hmm. and of course there there is a you know probably quite a lot of cano- can- canonical authors be- people could read read them more out of a sense of duty and this i want you know freddie f- remarks on having finished av dex's latest you know that, that he hadn't enjoyed it exactly but, but 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 he was pleased with himself for having got through it and understood what was going <laughs> on in it and there is that sense of sp- 
sort of self-congratulation which can come to you, which is not actually the same thing as the, the positive pleasure of, of, of actually reading the text. Um, and I think I will have always believed that I wanted to write things which were um, which were enjoyed mm -hmm. yeah and if admired so much the better <laughs> so let, let's talk about then the um the second part of the book i mean of course it's in five parts but the part one is very much it's a memoir of freddie green it's in oxford and then in part two the the time period shifts um but also the the voice shifts so of course we it's um, the first part is a memoir so it's in the first person and then we we shift into a sort of a let's say a close third person yeah. uh, perspective and I, I was interested in this shift also because as I said earlier sort of this was a moment of someone like uh, Johnny Sparshold who was more or less a contemporary of yours that you should then choose to sort of to separate yourself from the first person voice in oh I see yes um, it just seemed to me that jo Johnny is this kind of you know acutely observant and feeling but um illiterate kind, mm. kind of person would, would be a very diff difficult mm. person to write to write the persona of and one would come up rub up against just the sort of ontological questions of who mm -hmm. is you know wh where is the first person narrative coming from uh -huh. um and i wanted to throw the reader rather at the end of mm. the first first person section by that jump into the third person mm. um and i hope also to, s to sow seeds of doubt about mm. the veracity, perhaps, of what has been mm -hmm. recorded in the first part of the book. Um, it's one of the themes of the book, I suppose, that you know, of how little we know for, for sure mm -hmm. about what other people get up to. Mm -hmm. um, but the second part of the book is seen, in t which is set on a rather penitential Cornish holiday in 1966, is seen entirely from the point of view of David Sparshot's 14-year-old mm -hmm. son. Um, who's so preoccupied with his <laughs> French exchange friend yeah. <laughs> um, that, that he, that, uh, and the, the misery of the fact that the year before they'd mm -hmm. had a fantastic time in Nîmes but um, in, in, the, in the intervening year Bastien mm -hmm. has I'm afraid, rather gone off mm -hmm. boys mm -hmm. uh, discovered girls instead so, 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 so John is in this, this sort of fury of, of longing mm -hmm. and re resentment and um, uh, and consequently un unaware of the things mm -hmm. that are going on in, in his parents' world, mm -hmm. which is uh, which I suppose the reader looks at more knowledgeably over his shoulder, as it were. And of course, even though you don't um, sort of address this directly in the book, of course, 1966 was a very uh, significant time uh, in Britain for um, for gay men, in yeah. fact, because it was right at the moment that. Uh, the illegality of homosexual acts were being debated and a year before um, I think the first kind of wave of decriminalization would um, that's right yes so exactly a year before before the sexual offenses act mm. of, of 1967 yeah I, I he of course is completely unaware of this mm. as the rest of the characters seem to be but it is something in the background of the story which is mm. which is going to prove to be a some mm. consequence yeah. and, and of course also it's um i think as readers when we we, we you know we we pick up on the sort of the signifiers okay we're in the 60s now i think we have we also have certain preconceptions of what the 60s meant and of course i remember having this discussion um uh with my father who's in his sort of late teens in the in the 60s and uh saying sort of oh, what were you doing in the 60s and he said well you know I was in Bournemouth. It didn't. The sixties <laughs> didn't really arrive yes. there. And I thought one of the things that was very charming about this section was the sort of that it wasn't sort of the swinging sixties of London or San Francisco or somewhere like that. But it was still very much a kind of an upwardly mobile middle class family. Absolutely, yeah, sort of yes. Holiday. Only very slightly touched, mm. but I mean, rather like o Oxford being out of the sway of the war. Mm. You know, I mean. It, the, the, this fa family from Nuneaton, you know, mm. having their their annual holiday in Cor Cornwall, mm. um, are, are only s slightly Im impinged on by mm. the, by these things, which now, uh, in a rather caricatural way, seem to, mm. to sort of define the the era. Mm -hmm. and I think that's you know that's that's so obviously generally true of, of sort of social history. Mm -hmm. And when you were you said earlier that you were sort of you're reluctant to put in too many historical signifiers, um, and in fact it's. If I remember rightly, there's only a, perhaps a couple of moments that the book progresses where you specifically say what day, what you know, what date, what year it is. Yes. Yeah, okay. um, and I think that's a, it's it struck me as a very fine line to tread between sort of not not telling readers what year it was and 
um, expect, you know, and, and being able to tell the story while at the same time not dropping all these historical signifiers. Like, you might think the writer might be tempted to go one way or the other, to sort of begin a section 1966 and therefore not worry about the reader picking it up or just yes. kind of top loading it with um you know with cultural references um was that a difficult balance to strike um you're making it sound as if it should have been but um, <laughs> I, 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 i'm not sure it was i, I mean I'd, I'd got onto this idea of you know the, the, the time jumps in mm -hmm. my previous book the stranger's child and in not making it explicit at the beginning of a section as a rule you know when it was um and enjoying the the invitation that mm -hmm. I hope the reader too enjoys of uh, um, to to work out what's going on and it may be that the the second section is almost too unspecific I don't know I mean I, I uh, and, and perhaps readers are having to sort of go to Wikipedia and things to find out when the hell Tom Jones was <laughs> uh, or when uh, the saint was on TV <laughs> yeah uh, and, uh, and I can't now remember quite how many little mm -hmm. little exact clues as to date I, I put in um, but certainly a, a sen again the sense of the natural now mm -hmm. of people living in the present um, I, was one of the things I wanted to to, to keep but I also, I also think the sort of the reader's trust is earned by the writer in that respect as well sort of like well, I, I, I think if, you, if, it's, that, if yeah. it's done well enough <laughs> as I think it is here that like you don't you don't go rushing to Wikipedia you don't no. feel lost you just assume okay at a moment it will become more yes. or less clear yes. where we're talking about yeah. sort of um, um, yeah. people you know we are very confused about when things happened mm. and, and as you get older you know time goes faster and faster which is uh, mm -hmm. one of the effects i was trying to capture in this book and something you think was three years ago was 10 years ago mm -hmm. and, and so forth and you don't quite remember mm -hmm. when, when things were so it, an element of sort of uncertainty about uh. that I, I don't mind and indeed the the special affair itself which I'm going to let you talk about because i you, it's one of those things in the book you need to tread very carefully around if you without if you don't want to give too much away but actually essentially occurs between uh sections Absolutely. two and three in yeah. fact yes. um and I'm, I'm curious about the again the decision to keep it to keep it off the page to keep it off screen yeah. anyway. i think you know as i was saying at the beginning i, I was interested in in what might have led up to it and, and, and in what the consequences of it might have been much more than in the actual mechanics of a scandal which are sort of a bit boring and depressing and mm -hmm. um, we first learn about this scandal actually eight, eight years after it's mm. happened um, and what I hoped to create was that strange or the murky feeling of uh, uncertainty and half remembered mm -hmm. uh, details of, of, a, of a famous scandal which has happened that long ago mm -hmm. um, and there were various sc you know obviously when I was a, a boy the Profumo scandal being the, mm. the biggest of them all um, and uh, there was a scandal to do with an architect called Poulsen in the early 1970s, which was not a, a sexual thing, but was to do with corruption in local government. Poulsen mm. was, a, was a, a sort of a successful architect, and you know, it, it involved members of parliament, and, mm. uh, and it became something much, much bigger than it had seemed li liable to be. Mm -hmm. And um, But talking to people about it... Now, uh, it Barely, I mean, if you mention a name of someone involved, it, it sort of brings back the whole rather sort of shabby atmosphere of that mm -hmm. that moment. So I wanted it to be a sort of lingering mm -hmm. stain, as it were, rather, mm -hmm. uh, and that, that to be the point of it, um, mm -hmm. ra rather than an actual sort of nuts and bolts mm -hmm. investigation of the scandal itself. And I guess also in a way, for someone like um, Johnny Sparshold, who was sort of a, a young man, you know, an adolescent when it occurred, it's a sort of in a way, he would have been protected from certain elements of it by by his family and by the people around him. So I think that's right. Yes, and he, he says his, his mother sort of tries to keep him from finding mm -hmm. out what's going on, and um, and because he can't read at all well. I mean, his his school friends are reading about it in the Daily Mail or something, mm -hmm. but they probably know more about it than he does. <laughs> one of the um, one of the things which plays a very important role in the book is art. Um, whether it be, uh, you know, obviously uh, later on, you know, Johnny has a career as a um, as a restorer of paintings and also and also as an artist. But from the very beginning, I think the I think maybe the very first moment we meet him, he is sketching in the book. Yeah. Um, and likewise, uh, the there is a picture drawn of his father um, back in the the Oxford section, which again. 
um, is sort of a recurring um, a recurring image in That's the book. Right, yeah. um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about that, but maybe this would be a good moment for the second uh, reading. Okay, yeah. Which I think is Johnny as a in, in his practice as an art restorer. Oh. Um, Johnny has come to London um, in 1974 when he's 22. He's been to a rather um, advanced art college where he's been encouraged to be an abstract expressionist and, and paint gigantic paintings uh, sort of tw twice as tall as himself um, but he needs to make a living and um, he's gets an apprenticeship with a, a very old-fashioned Chelsea picture dealer um, and finds in, uh, his life instead working on a minute scale on tiny little Victorian canvases and um, he res rather resents and, and, and resists this as being sort of trapped in the, this rather musty world of, of the past, but he's also learning various um, skills. And um, all, the, all the while, when he, he's not working in the shop, he's, um, we see him still sketching, um, and he is uh, the... The principal character need, needs to be observant in one way or another in, in, in a novel, and um, you send him into a scene to kind of look at it on your behalf, as it were. And though Johnny is not at all literary, he, he's sort of he's always looking, sketching. Um, anyway, here we see him in his role as apprentice. Just a very short passage. It was dark under the trees on the far side of the meadow, though spots of distant light showed through between them and a late glow coloured the dull green wall of leaves above. In the foreground, three pale saplings made a line. The early evening flared before it darkened into deeper mystery. Behind the right-hand sapling, covered by its grey trunk, ran a knotty thread. It was a rough canvas laid down on a piece of hardboard and damaged later by water down the left-hand edge. The delicate detachment and re-sticking of the damaged portion had been done by Cyril, his employer. But the cleaning and retouching with a fine brush whose every sleek and graded hair showed distinctly through the magnifying visor was Johnny's own work. Never before had he paid such minute attention to a painting, certainly not to one of his own. He saw it decompose itself under the lens. He had a view of it not even the artist had had, although elements in the design, which the artist must have understood, refused to give up their secrets. The evening in Kensington Gardens had been nearly night when the picture came in and was taken from its wrapping, the brittle lairs of a twelve-year-old Daily Mail. The lifting of old brown varnish had brought out a low fence, a row of mere transparent dashes across the foreground, and an unsuspected hurrying figure half seen at the right-hand edge. And in the mid-distance, almost under the trees, was another small vertical presence that might have been a person, a man in a jacket and hat, or a woman in a short cape, but it was so slender it could have been a statue, a bust on a plinth. Were there statues like that in Kensington Gardens? The vertical mark, a few quick brush strokes, was a riddle. Over the week that he worked on the picture, itself painted surely in an hour or two, the image, the finite information of the brush strokes, and the indefinitely large suggestion they made became somehow secret knowledge, and the presence beneath the trees took on an occult significance, like a figure of London life he was yet to meet. When he raised the goggles, there was a second of giddy confusion that the picture he'd come from was only eight inches by five. Johnny had never heard of the artist Paul Maitland before last week, but now he felt an eerie involvement in his work. The buyer would see the scratched PM in the dark impasto of the foreground and never know that a half inch of grey gold grass, cut hay perhaps in the middle distance, and other minute touchings in among the dim green foliage were the work of the invisible JS some 80 years on. Thank you. Um, 
I'm very conscious, actually, that uh, we've, we've talked for quite a long time, and so there will be questions from the audience. So, But I've got a couple more things I would selfishly like to ask you before yeah. handing over. Um, that when I, when I read that passage, the, the unsuspected hurrying figure kind of revealed with this kind of with this artistic precision and treatment it couldn't help but make me think of the if we can talk about the project of the novel in a way which was sort of to me anyway seemed one of the the, the novel's intention seems to be sort of revealing a certain type of life which had perhaps been buried under the kind of the Brit the old brown varnish of of history, yes. specifically the life of gay men and women in yeah. Britain. Would that be a fair... Yes, I mean, I intended to have some sort of re resonance of that, that kind. Um, the, thing, the things which are hidden merely by time. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes, the, the, of course, they're hidden more deliberately, mm -hmm. and they may, you know, to pursue the metaphor, they may be painted over, or uh, a picture may be re reworked in some way to mm -hmm. conceal things. Um, in this case, it is just just the the passage of time mm -hmm. that has obscured these these little details, mm -hmm. um, and there's something undeniably exciting mm -hmm. exciting about rec recovering anything out mm -hmm. of the out of the shadows. Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want to labour it too closely, sure, but, it, but yeah. it seemed to me a nice sort of analogy for that. But yeah. one of one, I think one of the things that perhaps the book also does to kind of lift things out of the shadows is specifically from a linguistic point of view, um, and I think. Whether that be in sort of, um, let's say, everyday language, um, like again, I think there is a there's a moment where there's a shift in the use of the word. You know, uh, early on it's sort of always lavatory, and then later it becomes loo, and that felt to me like a sort of something which, sort of, it's a major a, shift. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I, I agree. Um, but also, of course, of the way that um, that uh, gay men talk about their experience and the way that they're talked about yeah. by society at large as yes. well. So there's a moment in the Oxford section where. Uh, David Sparshall tries out, I think, the word uh, pansy, yes. and sort of seeing the kind of reaction it gets. Yes, um, that's right, yeah. Another moment where I think one of the characters is described as being over-emotional. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I would, I, I'm just interested to, to sort of to hear you reflect on the, w the way the language of, um, of the, the way gay men interact with each other has has evolved in the sort of the period and how you were able to sort of tap into the the different vocabularies well, i've done quite a lot of work at various times at most of those times now quite a long time ago um into the, these questions you know and i looked uh, as a when i was doing graduate work at oxford i looked into the whole question of how gay writers who couldn't write openly about their sexuality um sort of dealt with it, how they concealed it and and the various interesting ways in which they revealed it, uh, and, and the whole vocabulary of how gay people were referred to as being as over emotional or musical or whatever, uh, and then you know the, the fame, a much later thing of the, the, a friend of Dorothy's. And so, um, uh, I mean, they're 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 amusing and but but as, but revealing as you, as you say of, of, of sort of all sorts of assumptions. Um, it's one of the things I mean, uh, fun for me, and I hope. So, entertaining perhaps slightly dismaying for the reader sort of seeing the move from the complete nocturnal mm -hmm. blackout secrecy of the first part to the, as you were saying in your nice introduction to the, the later parts of the book in which people are broadcasting their most intimate yeah. acts online you know yeah. for anybody to see um, and that amazing change in the idea mm -hmm. of, sort of personal privacy mm -hmm. uh, you know I mean it, we, this book rather focuses uh, um, not unlike other books I've written on on gay lives and there, but actually this is a, a general sort of cultural shift which uh -huh. is going on, and I think doesn't only apply to mm -hmm. to gay people, but you know how you talk about and represent uh -huh. your um, the private life. It's mm -hmm. a very fascinating. Thing. And so, as as my sort of final question, I'd like to address that point. Actually, is the um, because I would say in in Britain specifically at the moment, uh, but maybe maybe in other countries too, there is this sort of there is. There has been kind of a, a rising nostalgia for uh, for the, the way things were mm -hmm. in the past. As in in many ways, the kind of the totemic event of the Second World War still hangs very heavily over over British culture. I mean, we saw that in the whole uh, the way that the Brexit debate was um, was was handled, um, and yet uh, so so I think that there is a sense of kind of of things being lost. 
but also one one thing I'd say this is in in no way a, a sort of a nostalgic book, and it, in a sense it can't be because the the position of gay men in 2012, where the book ends up, compared to in 1940. One was it? I think yeah. forty. Forty, yeah. Well, uh, it sort of is so significantly, so significantly yes, changed course, and yeah. improved. Yes, no, of course it, it is. But you know, I much rather be living now, than, mm-hmm. <laughs> now than then. Um, but I seem, I sort of feel more interest somehow in writing about uh-huh. then because gay, gay life was more um, complicated and, and conducted in, mm-hmm. in ways which are actually rather fascinating for mm-hmm. the for the no, the novelist um, the, the the clandestine aspects of it and so forth um, and um, I've, I've noticed myself you know there's nothing sort of programmatic about it mm-hmm. but I've noticed myself repeatedly going back to these mm-hmm. these periods in the past when things were more challenging and mm-hmm. and, the, and the linguistic questions too were, were mm-hmm. more sort of in, interesting um, but I, yeah, I, I profoundly distrust this this sense of, mm-hmm. of, of cultural lost or sort of sociological, uh, historical nostalgia mm-hmm. generally. I mean, it mm-hmm. seems, seems to be very, very corrosive at mm-hmm. the moment and, and a sort of fantasy, of course. Mm-hmm. And incredibly powerful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nonetheless. very powerful, yeah. yeah. um, Over to you. Uh, if you have a question for Alan, raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you so everyone can hear you. Let's begin with this gentleman just here, and then we'll come to you in a minute. Um, so... Uh, partly with regard to what you were just saying about identity, I feel that um, increasingly literature, although it's always been uh, bought, sold, uh, and written in categories, is being divided according to the identity of its author and its subjects in the terms of identity politics. There's women's fiction, gay and lesbian fiction, black history, etc. There's even, you know, there's a gay bookshop in the Marais, for example. To what extent do you think that um, this is the founding of a new uh, tradition, or one that's or- always existed? And to what extent would you like your work, or do you expect your work, to be read in a tradition that is in some ways set apart, or would want to set itself apart from the rest of a more classical literary tradition? Because I feel that... Um, like so much of this recent book, your work occupies a somewhat liminal position with regard to that, in that it has a lot more, more seemingly classical influence than uh, than specifically uh, identitarian. Yeah, no, I would I completely agree with that. I mean, I think I've lived lived through a big change in this respect. You know, when I when I started writing. I was writing very deliberately as a gay writer and writing a, a, a gay novel and sort of laying claim to a large, fascinating subject which I've uh, had barely been written about in kind of English fiction. Um, and it was at a moment in the, the mid '80s when there was c- considerable sort of political charge and point in doing that. Um, and you know, this was the period when we started to see g- gay sections in bookshops. I mean, I have to say that there are fewer gay sections in bookshops, and there are far fewer gay bookshops themselves now um i mean you you still have uh what's it well, yes, which is uh, a marvelous thing but I, I mean in london we still have gays the word which has hung on against sort of m- many challenges in, in new york where they there used to be half a dozen gay bookshops i think they're pretty well all gone now um I don't entirely sort of lament this because I, I think something was achieved over the over those decades since I started writing, um, and um, I think the, the understanding of sexual identity has itself become much more sort of fl- fluid. And um, I mean, I, I think I always used to enjoy being both in the gay section and in the, the main section. And I, that's, and I certainly never saw myself as writing exclusively for a gay readership um, and naturally wanted to sell as many books as possible <laughs> uh, and I, I mean I grew up when looking around at the time I was starting to, to write my first book there were, there were things like the, the, I mean, the very admirable gay men's press in L- London which was run by gay men and published g- gay fiction for gay readership essentially and it seemed to me from the start one ought to be able to do something a bit bigger than that um, and um, you know, there are all sorts of other factors involved just in sort of going on and th- through one's life and getting older and experiencing more and seeing things from shifting perspectives um, and the questions of identity though they interest me I, you know they, they don't they're not sort of central I feel to what I'm doing there was this gentleman just here 
Hi. First, thank you so much for all of your novels. Um, but I, we've spoken a lot tonight, and of course, given the scope and of of this novel, it's understandable to focus on all that has changed. Um, but when you read that section about this disembodied torso in an illuminated square, I can't help but think about the disembodied torsos in illuminated squares on Grinder that people are now very accustomed to. And I wonder if there's any thing that you feel hasn't changed and, and whether these are ever opportunities to show that there is something that remains about gay culture or about yeah, I think I do. Th I do think that, and I ho I'm pleased you sort of pick up on that that idea of yes, of, of the, the image of the desirable male, as it were, which, which is created you know, right right at the start of the book and persists through to the end. Uh, and at the end of the book, we we see this now sort of seventy year old uh, image sort of uh, alongside the, the the images that people are cr creating in their online profiles and, and so forth, uh, and people being yeah. You know, um, Magnetized, directed by by the idea of, of the this image of the desirable male. Yeah, um, I do. I do see a continuity there. Any more questions? Yeah, gentlemen, right back. Slightly parochially, why Christchurch rather than New or uh, Merton <laughs> or? <laughs> But but more seriously, how do how do you see yourself in relation to other writers describing Oxford? Because I think there's sort of demythologization of Oxford in in the first section of this novel compared to the things that were that sort of usual writing you get about Oxford, where one has a sense of timelessness, this uh, almost mystical place, completely mm. set aside from the worries of the world. I, I mean, I have written about Oxford in. You know more glancingly in, in other other books, and I think often in the same light, which probably reflects some of my own feeling about it as, as a, a, a place of sort of miserably unfulfilled desire, <laughs> uh, and uh, the, these uh, people being hopelessly in, in love with with unattainable beauties and so forth. I and mean, I say I've known it all my life, and I, I suppose for a lot of that that period, you know, the, the, certainly the sort of nine or ten years I actually spent li living there. It was very recurrently permeated by those sort of emotions. Um, and they do mix up in a rather toxic sort of way, perhaps, with this, this more historic sense of the, as you say, the timelessness and beauty of the place, and, you know, to which I was extremely susceptible. Um, but it was quite... It, it was another reason it was quite interesting to write about it in the, the very odd circumstances of, of, of 1940. Um, you know, a, a generation after the sort of the Brideshead generation, um, and you know, in completely different terms, and, and that's one of the exciting things about the Larkin book. I think you know, it couldn't be more different from that. I think we have time for one more question. If there is anybody, raise your okay, right at the back there. Yeah. Thank you. I'd be curious to hear you reflect um, if you have thoughts on the impact of co-education in places like Oxford on gay male culture. Well, I wish I knew more about it. I mean, Oxford was uh, still sort of pretty monolithically... What's the opposite of co-ed? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, when I was there. Uh, and um, so most of, most of these changes came came subsequently. And what they did to... I mean, they could only have improved gay life, I feel, I mean, <laughs> or what, what it was like when I was there. Um, so, um, but I'm really not in a, in a well enough informed position to say, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, that is all we've got time for, unfortunately, at least for the conversational part of the evening. Uh, we will be serving wine. Please do stick around, uh, have conversations with each other, come up and say hi to Alan. I'm sure he'd be happy to, to sign some books for you. Stacks and stacks of which we have at the till, so please do pass by there. Of the Sparse Old Affair, but also of all of Alan's other novels. Um, so, so yeah, do, do stick around, do read it. It's such a wonderful book, as I'm sure um, you, you understand after having listened to Alan talk about it for the last hour. And please do join me one more time in saying thank you to Alan Hollinghurst. <laughs>